Greetings, folks. I hope you're enjoying your reading so far. What I wanted to talk to you about today in our uh, our last lecture of this week is Old English word formation strategies because, of course, every language makes new words. And I love that fact. The idea that there is no perfect word, that all words are flexible, that any culture, any any people at any time will make any word be what they want it to be. So how did the Old English, how did the Anglo-Saxons make their words, make the words that they had work for them when they came across some idea that they hadn't quite grasped before? How do you make new words? Well, the principal strategies for the Anglo-Saxons boil down to two things, affixing and compounding. Affixing is simply adding things on to words you already know, and compounding is mashing two words together. Very simple. And while many languages still do that, contemporary English, modern English, doesn't tend to do it quite as much as you might think. And I'd like to give you some indication of why. By way of suggesting that the strangeness, particularly of compounding, is, well, how do I say it? Problematic and imposed. But let's start with the basics. Affixing. What the hell does that mean? Well, it really just means adding something to either the beginning or the end of a word to modify its meaning. That is, adding a prefix or a suffix, something either at the beginning or the end of the word, that makes it mean the specific thing that you want it to mean. And this is actually the most common method of word formation in Old English. And by the way, this is no longer the case in Modern English. We have different word generating mechanisms than the Anglo-Saxons did. And I really want to spend some time talking about those. But for the meantime, Let's focus on what the Anglo-Saxons did. We'll take that as our starting point. Among the two options with affixing, we'll start with prefixing, because that's what comes first. And, well, we may as well go in uh, instinctive order. So we'll start with y, that is G-E, or yach e if you want to really be specific. That is the marker of the past participle, which actually in itself over time became a way of generating new words that had specialized meanings associated with the original verb. So, for example, we have hieran, and I've spoken to you about that before, with yahiret. That is here and past participle heard, as in was heard. This is a very simple past participle. It's converting the verb into an adjective, it describes the noun, and it uses the verb, the action of the verb, to indicate how the noun is to be understood. Well, fine, great. But let's take a look at gone, go. We end up with yagan, meaning conquer. What the hell does that mean? Except maybe, I conquered you. Yagan. But seriously. This is an example of, of the past participle becoming its own verb and in a really interesting social context. So if yagan, that is gone, means conquer, what does that say about how these folks lived? I'll leave you to figure that out for yourself. But let's move on. So we have brother, brother. But the y. So, your brother indicates a member of a monastic community, primarily. That is, <laughs> somebody who has been brothered is a monk, which kind of makes sense. Again, we, we, we call monks brother this, brother that, brother the other. And the Anglo-Saxons would just say, your brother. He, he went with the monks. He became a brother. Or on the other hand, we have yanip coming from nipan. So 
Nippon is to grow dark, and Yanip is darkness. So we have an adjective, Yanip, which would originally have been darkened. So Wes Yanip, becoming simply darkness. But of course, we no longer use y to make words, or really at all. A number of our prefixes, though, that are still in active use in modern English, we can trace back to Old English. So, for negation or reversal of a root word, we have un, or in Old English, un, and miss. So, something can be sound, but its opposite is unsound. We can understand or we can misunderstand. That kind of thing. These are very common still. We also have prefixes coming out of Old English for the relative positions of things. So, in, over, after, under, for. So, something can be inside or outside. I left that one out. It can be overhead. We can overdo something. Or it can be an afterthought. We can see something directly, or if we're anticipating it, we can foresee it. So, for is relative position in time, as in before. But it can also be relative position in space, as in the foreground, as opposed to the background. Similarly, we can be paid, or we can be underpaid or overpaid. We can be underwhelmed or overwhelmed. And as an intensifier, we use out from Old English, oot. So, the sun outshines the moon. If a person puts in a fantastic effort at something, we say they outdid themselves. That kind of thing. Other Old English prefixes are less common. So, ah, as in abide, be, as in become, for without the e, as in forget, or forth, you can be forthcoming, or to, as in today. These still exist in words, but they're no longer actively in use. They're, they're kind of fossilized. In Old English, they were much more common. They were much more active. And we really only have, as I said, fossil forms of them now, things that have held on in everyday use, but are no longer productive. Similarly, Old English had a number of suffixes. These, of course, each served a distinct function, as with the prefixes. A couple of these are still quite common. So, for example, ness, as in darkness, or shippe, as in lordship. These are used for forming abstract nouns from concrete things, from concrete nouns. So, darkness is the state of being dark, and lordship is the abstract being of a lord. Other examples using more contemporary words might be directorship as in being the director of something, or premiership, as in, in this past election, Blaine Higgs held on to the premiership of New Brunswick. That is, it describes a position that a person occupies. Now, of course, Old English also has a number of suffixes that we no longer use or no longer use very much. Ung, we simply don't use. Dom, as in kingdom, is another one of those fossil forms that we have in modern words, but we're no longer using to make new words. Same thing with oth, as in length, which would have originally been lengeth, or hod, as in childhood, or neighborhood, or lock, as in wedlock. And it means exactly what it looks like, something to which you're bound. Raden, as in kindred, is another that we still have, but are no longer actively using. But what all of these do is they take a concrete thing or a concrete idea and express some abstraction of it. Suffixes can also be used to form what we call agent nouns, nouns that indicate the doing of a certain thing. So, ones in common use are ere, as in hunter, or estre, as in gangster, mobster, or the long-defunct file-sharing service, Napster. Notice that era tends to be attached to a verb, whereas estra is more commonly attached to a noun. Or just to move it a little closer to home, when I'm being grouchy with my fiancé, she will sometimes refer to me as the grumpster. 
That is, these are present in the consciousness of speakers as things that they can add to words at any time to make new words. Ones no longer in use or in common use are end, a, ah, and bora. I don't know of any modern words that use end or a. Ah. The only one I can think of that uses bora is neighbor. That is, with ne, ne, related to nigh, meaning near, your neighbors are the people who are nigh you, who are near you. But even in that isolated usage, this one doesn't seem to have a strong sense of agency. Unless maybe you think of it in terms of neighbor indicating the people with whom you are in active community, but that may be a bit of a stretch. We can also use suffixes to turn words into adjectives. For example, e as in speedy, leek as in childlike, full as in wonderful, less as in fearless, ed as in legged, and ish as in childish are all used to turn nouns into adjectives. On the other hand, sum as in wholesome is used to modify an adjective so to give it a more specialized meaning. So whole is entire, or if we want to go back to its root, hall, meaning healthy, wholesome is conducive to health, or generally associated with well-being, both physical and otherwise. Now, some is no longer in really common use in active word formation right now, whereas e like, less, and ish are all very common. No longer in general use are kund, fast, and wende, where I can't think of any words that actually use kund or wende. Fast we still have in a couple of fossilized forms, but even these are antiquated. So in archaic modern English we might have said something is soothfast, sooth meaning truth, and fast indicating sort of an intensifier, or rather pointing towards something like stability or reliability. So if we said something was soothfast, what it would have meant was it is reliably true. This seems to be related just to the word fast in its antiquated sense as being secure. So if we tie something down, we're making it fast. Or if we attach or secure something, we can say we fasten it. Same word. But even so, as I said, this is an archaic usage at this point. And that's prefixing. The other principal method of word formation in Old English was compounding. And this is still common in most of the other Germanic languages, no longer really common in English. And we certainly will talk about why. <clears throat> Now, as I said, compounding is just putting two words together to make a new word. And some of these are quite wonderful. I'm, I think I'd like to take a look at a few of them in Old English. And just work through what they mean. A few of them are actually downright poetic. Now, if we were in class, what I would be doing is showing you these slides and having you guess at what the words might mean before we actually take a look at the meaning. So I'll try to do something like that now. So if we take a look at a word like Sunbam or Luftaken or Luftaken or Theosax. Look at those for a second. Even just hit pause on the, uh, even just hit pause on your computer and see if you can figure out what some of those mean. I'm gonna guess you can. I think you can probably guess something about. The, I'm thinking you can probably come pretty close on the first two. The set. The third one will. The third one will give you. The third one will give you a bit of trouble. The first one, of course, is just sunbeam, 
Nothing's changed about that word except for the pronunciation, it's still spelled the same. The second one, love token, means something different now from what it meant in Old English. Luf is where we get our word love, but luf in Old English tended to have more of a sense of esteem. So a luf token in Old English would be a token of your esteem. It could even mean fame. The last word of Beowulf is lofjarn, literally eager for fame, yearning for fame. Theosex is a thigh sword. That is a short sword. Theo, of course, being the word for thigh. And sex, indicating a short sword, being also related to the name of the Saxons. Literally, what the word Saxon means is people who carry short swords, short sword people, or if you prefer, sword people. The last batch of words were, of course, compound nouns made from two nouns mashed together. But Old English also combined adverbs and nouns to make new nouns. See if you can guess what these three might mean, and I'm guessing they might give you some trouble. Eftboot, on Janhurf, and in the fail. Well, here they are. Eft simply means again, and I think we spoke about the word boat in the last lecture. It means remedy or healing. So literally again healing. So recuperation. Similarly, on Janhurf, literally back turn, simply, simply means to return. I'd like you to take a look at the modern English translations of those because they will give you a clue as to why we don't tend to make words this way anymore. In the fail, inside property, simply means household goods. In the, as inside makes perfect sense. Now that word fail is where we get our word fee, but notice it doesn't mean exactly the same thing in Old English as it means in Modern English. Common ground, of course, is that a fee or a fine would often have been paid in property rather than in currency at the time. Another method of compounding that the Anglo-Saxons employed was putting a noun together with an adjective to make a new adjective. So see what you think of these three. Domjarn, Eastcheld, and Alfschiene. I'm guessing you might actually have some idea what Eastcheld actually means. Dom yarn, maybe as well. Dom is where we get our word doom. And yarn is where we get our word yearn. Alfshina, which is my favorite in this entire slideshow, probably is going to be a little challenging. So let's take a look at them. That first one literally means glory eager. Dom is our word doom, but it doesn't have the same sense in Old English that it does in Modern English. In Old English, its meaning is more judgment and not in necessarily the negative or gloomy sense that we tend to associate doom, but simply in passing judgment on something. It's related to deem. That is, if you deem something acceptable, that is your doom. It also has an association with glory, so a very positive association. Yearn, as I said, is where we get our word yearn, so literally you are yearning for glory. Eastcheld is simply ice cold, and I suspect you probably got that one. Alfschiene is just lovely. It's, it's one of my favorite Old English words. Literally, it means elf bright or elf shining. Schiene was re related to our word for shine or sheen. And its modern English translation is simply beautiful, which isn't nearly as interesting. This is a wonderfully concrete word that we now translate as something quite abstract. Another word formation strategy that the Anglo-Saxons used was simply combining two adjectives to make a new adjective. So take a look at these three. Wiesheedy, Deadboren, and Herstep. Of those three, I suspect Dadboren is the one you're most likely to have an intuitive grasp of. 
Although the element wheeze in wheeze heady might give you a clue there. Hair step is just a fun one. So wheeze heady is simply wise minded. Heed is, is a word associated with thinking, with, with the mind. Wheeze, of course, is wise. Dead born hasn't really changed all that much. Born is just born. Dead born, literally, still born. So that's very close to its old meaning. Heh step is, is a wonderful one, isn't it? Uh, heh is simply high, and step is where we get our word steep. So it's literally high steep, but very high is what it means. Yet another possibility is to combine an adverb with an adjective to make a new adjective. So we have overmoed, uplang, and thurheavy. These are probably easier once you hear them than just looking at them because, of course, spelling is a factor. But overmoed, I suspect, won't give you too much trouble. The other two, maybe. Although the second element of thurheavy is pretty obvious, I think. So here they are. Overmoed is simply arrogant. And again, take a look at those those roots. Over is simply over. It's the same word. And mode is a mind word. So over mode literally means over mind or having too high an opinion of oneself. That's, that's the best reading I can give without actually just going to the modern English translation. That, that's, more, that's a more literal meaning of the word. As far as uplong, well, up is just up. So up long, meaning upright, it, you might have guessed tall, and that would be an intuitive one as well. Thur heavy, very heavy. Thur is where we get our word thorough. So thoroughly heavy. And for our final example, we'll take a look at combining an adjective with a noun to make a new adjective. And a couple of these, you can probably guess by just reading them. Bloody toth. I love that one. On the other hand, glad mode. These two won't give you much trouble. Fair sib might. But take a minute and think about it anyways. Because the roots there are still roots that exist in modern English. Well, here they are. Bloody tooth is simply bloody toothed. Again, wonderfully concrete. Glad mode, glad hearted. So you notice that mode can be translated as mind or heart. It's where we get our word mood. And glad mode is simply cheerful. Fair sib means distantly related. So not a close cousin. The roots of this word, of course, we still use. Fair is far. And sib is the root of our word sibling. So its meaning has changed, but it is still present in the language. And that's it for Old English Word Formation Strategies. A shorter talk than usual, I suppose, and I hope that's all right with you folks. I'd like to leave you with a few questions, though. To what degree do these constructions seem odd to you? That is, when you see their literal translations, they probably look a little strange, and the reasons why they might look a little strange are historically explicable. But I'd also like you to think about ways in which they intuitively make sense given the way speakers of the language would have used those words. That is, it is quite intuitive to mash words together to make new words. Most languages, I think, do this. That modern English doesn't do it or doesn't do it very much says something very strange about English and English speakers, and some assumptions that have actually come into the language, come into the language culture over the last many centuries. Think, for example, and I want to take a German, a German example now. The word for telephone in German is Fernsprecher, literally far speaker. Two good German words mashed together to make a new word. The English word, of course, is telephone. Now, this is a compound as well, 
but it's not a compound made from what we call native words. Tele means far in Greek, as in telemarketing, telecommuting, telepathy, telekinesis. Phone, of course, indicates sound or speech. So, telephone means pretty much Fernsprecher, but rather than saying far speaker, we say telephone. That is, we import our words from some source other than the English language when we want to make new words. And this is what we usually do. I'm not going to say why right now. I want you to think about it. And we will get into, I think, talking about that to some degree, at least next week. For now, though, I think I will just leave you and get this edited and posted, hopefully in more decent a time than I was able to get the Monday lecture up. And I think probably tomorrow I'll post a few things for you to listen to or to watch as we wrap up or as we move toward wrapping up our, our old English unit. So until Friday, I hope you're enjoying your weeks and I do look forward to speaking with you.